you would stand with me this morning. We're going to go to the book of Haggai, so I'll give you some extra time. Just one of those things when you have minor prophets, people tend not to quite know where they are. <laughs> At least he's not too small of a book. <laughs> some of them are real brief. Haggai, chapter 1. I'm happy that you're here this morning, that you were able to make it today, that you trusted God and got in your vehicle and came on over. And we pray that the Lord will speak to you this morning, and I believe that he will. Anybody else believe that he will? Hey, God, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I love you and thank you for what you have done so far this morning. You're moving in this house and the touching of your people. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you have made that way and that we've allowed you to, to bring the word in now and speak it. And I pray that you speak your word and your message alone. Anoint these lips of clay. Have your way, O oh Lord, in this house this morning. That each and every one of us can hear, thus saith the word of the Lord, and receive it into our hearts and grow in grace. We love you and thank you. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Why don't you lift him up one more time before you sit down. Amen. You may be seated. I'll title this today, Let Me Take You Back. Let Me Take You Back. The first seven verses of Haggai doesn't sound too promising for the children of God. Uh, there seems to be some sort of a confusion in what God is saying compared to what his people are saying. They're saying one thing and God is saying another. They're, they're saying that, yeah, yes, we can do what we want to in our own houses, in our own lives, with our own things, but it's not time to build the house of God yet. It's not time to do what the kingdom of God is about. We're about ourselves and not about the kingdom, and, and the Lord is making it clear through his prophet here that he knows full well what they have said. He says, I know what they're saying. I know how they're saying it, and I want them to understand that all they're doing is saving up nothing. Everything that they're doing is going out the window. They're not going to be blessed because they are not putting the kingdom first. Let's read on, and, and you'll see what I'm saying. Verse 8 he says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, that you run every man unto his own house. He said, the reason you're not getting anywhere is because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. The reason that it's not happening for you, you're doing all the other things right, is because you're not putting the house of God first. You're not, you're saying, as a matter of fact, that the house of God can lay waste and it's okay with you as long as you are taken care of. And God is saying, it doesn't matter how hard you work, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter what wealth you attain, when you bring it together, I'm going to blow on it. It means I'm going to scatter it, I'm going to disperse it. How many here know this morning that when I pay my tithes and when I do offering and when I, that I am doing it gratefully and happily unto the Lord? Yeah. It's not for somebody else and I'm not supposed to do it grudgingly. I do it with joy so that I can bless him. I am not just doing it also so that he'll bless me. 
That's something that we can easily get caught up in. Well, I do it. Now I expect the blessing. I am blessed because I'm alive. I am blessed because he has allowed me to be here. I am blessed because he's allowed me ministry. I'm blessed in for the wife I have and the children I have. I am blessed over and over and over again in a way that I could never repay him for. I could never pay God back for what he has already blessed me with. It's not about that. It is about obedience. It is about saying this is what he requires. He could take everything that I have, but he doesn't do that because he gave everything that I have to me, including myself. But he doesn't do that. He says, send this 10% to me. This belongs to me. Just give it to me, and then you will be blessed. I don't do it so I'll be blessed. I do it in obedience to the word of God. And it is a work and an act of faith. I cannot say that I have faith if I don't have works to back it up. If the works that I am doing do not show the faith that I possess. And then this is the kind of the quandary that the children of God are in here in Haggai. And he's got to kind of give them a little tough word, and, and, uh, and he's doing it. He's, let's pick up. Uh, he says, therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. I got to... Control over everything, things you cannot ever possibly have control over, things to this day that we don't have control over. God says, I, I have all these things, and I will withhold them. I withhold them for a reason, though. I don't withhold them because I'm mean. I don't withhold them because I am vindictive. That is not why. I withhold them because you're not being blessed, and I want you to be blessed. But until you straighten it up, you're not going to be. I know that. So I'm doing this, pay attention, I am doing this so that you wake up, so that you have a chance to prepare the bar. That's what he's telling them. He says, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, cattle, and labor of the hands. He just went ahead and did it over everything. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord, then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people. And I love that phrase. I love that sentence. Then spake Haggai, who was the Lord's messenger. And what is he speaking He's speaking in the Lord's message. It's making sure you understand that it's coming from God and not from Haggai. He says, I am with you, saith the Lord. <laughs> and the Lord stirred up this, listen. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, all of them. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord, their host, Lord of hosts, their God, in the fourth and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. After they obeyed the word that came, it didn't matter how kind of rough the word might be for them, when they obeyed it, God blessed them. And something happened when he, they obeyed and then he blessed. Something happened. Did you read what that was? Did you see what that was? When, when that happened, when they lined themselves back up with what God was telling them to do, all of a sudden, everybody starts getting inspired. I don't know about serving God sometimes, brother. It's kind of boring. Well, you, I, you're not inspired, and the reason you're not inspired is because you're not doing what he's trying to get you to do. What happens is I become complacent. I become set back in my ways because I have become comfortable. And it doesn't even have to be a great place to get comfortable in. We humans can get comfortable easy. Some of us more so than others. There's some of us with a, with a little bit of bougie in us, and we need a little, you know, a little more than others. But a lot of us, I'm going to tell you myself, I don't have to have everything at my fingertips. I can become comfortable in situations that I should never be comfortable in. 
I can become, because it becomes, what it becomes is, it becomes, oh, I don't like change. Oh, I don't want to do something else. Oh, that can't possibly be the will of God for me to step out again. I mean, I just got done stepping out two years ago. It can't be God's will for me to step out again. But I'm here to tell you this morning, it's not my message. I'm not preaching to you, Brother Starr's opinion on the topic. God is coming to Acts the Apostolic Church, and he is saying it's time to work the change. It's time to step out in faith believing. It's time to get out of the comfort zone. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and beginning with verse 11, I'm preaching to you a simple message this morning, a straightforward message. Let me take you back. Let me just take you back. 1 Timothy 6, beginning with verse 11, says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. He says, run from those things that I listed before, which we didn't read. And then he says, follow these things. I let go and I move forward. I don't just let go. I don't just give up the sin of the past and the, and the discomfort of the past and all the guilt of the past and then sit where I am. I move forward. It is, it is the same motion. Philippians speaks of it as the same motion, as in letting go of the past and pressing to those things which are before. Fight the good fight. Say this all the time. I don't, how many times have you heard that phrase? Pulled from this verse. Fight the good fight. You know, even you might have people say it to you. It doesn't happen as often anymore, but it might. Somebody comes up to you and says, and you're telling them, I'm struggling, I got this going on, I got to pray. And you're and they'll go, fight the good fight, brother. Fight the good fight. What in the world does it mean? Well, first of all, it's not any good fight. It says fight the good fight. Of faith. And we believe oftentimes that we don't have to fight for that. We say, well, faith should just be there. I should just have it. I shouldn't have to struggle to have faith. And this says it's a good fight and you should be fighting it. You should be fighting the good fight of faith. What is it that God has called you to do that you haven't done yet? What is it that God has nudged you, pushed you, reminded you, shone the light on you, and then it's not happened in a couple of months, and you're like, oh, okay, it must not have been God's will. It was God's will then. It's God's will now. If I've not stepped down at it, all I'm doing is living in my comfort zone. I am not fighting the good fight. <laughs> and that's a faith. Lay hold, I love that, on eternal life. Well, I don't know if I'm going to make it to heaven or not. You're not doing it right. Salvation, you're doing it wrong. Here's how it works. You lay hold on it. You assure it. You make sure that you are saved. Well, I don't know if this is necessary. I don't know if that is necessary. You need to make sure. I've talked with plenty of people that don't make sure. And they have this opinion that they don't have to make sure. They're like, well, Jesus loves me, and I love him, and once in a while I go to church. Is that assured? Is that an assured salvation according to the word of God? No, it is not. It is not. You are to lay hold on salvation. Make it assured. Fight the good fight. Whereunto you thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You told everybody about it. I love Jesus. Do you remember? Let me take you back. Do you remember how you were before Jesus found you? Do you recall your mindset before he gave you peace of mind? Do you remember how struggling you were with your heart? All the desires, all the bad things that you were doing. You didn't want to do them. Paul says it's a war in my members. You felt that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And you didn't want to, but you were doing it anyway. When I would do that, which is good, I don't. When I do what is wrong, I don't want to do, and I do. That's exactly what you were. Do you remember how you were back then? Or were you perfect when you came to Jesus? 
Did you come to Jesus because you decided it was time to come to Jesus and just lay your perfection on the altar and said, hey, here I am. I know you've been waiting on me, and the moment has arrived. No, I can guarantee you that if you have a relationship with God, a real one, that's not what happened. I can tell you what did happen. Are you ready? Somehow somebody got through to you to visit church. Somebody got through to you to come and just, hey, it's a good place. They worship. And you're sitting in the worship service and you feel him. And he doesn't just come and make you feel good. He almost immediately begins to lay upon you conviction in your heart. He begins to expose, and my goodness, once the word came, there was nowhere to hide. As the word began, from someone, mind you, that didn't know you at all, begins to expose to you all those things you've been fighting that you don't want to fight, all that junk you've been living with that you don't want to be under anymore, the absolute desperation that you have, you have arrived at, and there was a drawing to you to the altar. You didn't even understand, a lot of you, what the altar was for. All you knew was that was the next step. The, the man said, hey, why don't you come up here and pray? Here's the, come. It's an altar call. And you came to a place that you had never been before. And when you knelt at Calvary, it was not about how good you were. You simply could not, you could not bow down at Calvary and admit you're a good man anymore. You're a good woman anymore. At Calvary is the realization that the only one good is Jesus and he's the only way for me to get out of this mess I'm in. Do you remember? Let me take you back to the first time you turned your life over to Jesus. What people don't always understand is that that process does not change. You don't come to the altar one time and you're done. It is the beginning of a beautiful thing, a beginning of a beautiful process. You don't just come up and now I'm saved. I say, Jesus, you're my Savior, and there is, that's all I got to do and I'm done. The Bible does not say that. And there's a reason it doesn't say it, because it doesn't work. Our humanity needs a whole lot more than a simplified statement. We need the blood. We need Calvary. For 430 years, oh, that's a long time. For 430 years, Israel didn't fight a war, Israel didn't lose a battle, they didn't lose one son. One father to it for 430 years. And before we get happy about it, let me tell you, it's because they were slaves. There was no war, there was no battle, because they weren't fighting. They were enslaved to another people. And that nation did its own fighting and did its own stuff, and they for 430 years did absolutely nothing because they were slaves. It is not the will of God for a single soul to be a slave. It is not his will for you and I to be put under some burden, no matter how comfortable it may become. And listen, they were crying out to God for deliverance. They were crying out. It wasn't a pleasant place they were in. Being a slave is not pleasant. Being beat all the time, you can lose your life and nobody cares except your family. Oh, but they don't care if you lose your life or not. You're building great things for somebody else. It's a horrible life for 430 years. You cannot tell me, you cannot tell me that before Moses came along, that those people, even though they were crying out to God, hadn't gotten used to being a slave. And I can show you why I believe that. I can show you in the Word how it pans out. Because Moses showed up and things had to change. First, God had to get a hold of Moses and change him. He thought he had a pedigree that was going to work. Everybody would have thought it was a pedigree that would work, and it's not. The Lord's not interested in your talent. He's not interested in your intellectual capability if you're not going to do it for him. He'll use those things if you let him, but don't ever let those things become your God. They are not. He's going to ask of you things you cannot do. 
Yes, he is. As talented as you are, as together as you are, Moses, he's going to come and say, I don't care about how good you think you could be a prince. I'm going to ask you to be a voice. I'm going to ask you to speak a word and not your word. As educated as you are, you can't do this word. It comes from me. You'll speak my word to set my people free. Let my people go. You're going to face the most powerful man of that era. You're going to look him in his eyes on his own terms, in his own house. And he knows who you are and what nonsense you've already done. And I'm not letting that stop you either. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made in the past. It doesn't matter what sins you've done or who knows about them. I'm still going to use you. I'm still going to turn you around. I'm still going to make you be my vessel if you'll let me. Why don't you clap your hands and lift him up? Let me take you back. They weren't fighting. They were crying out, but they were surrendering. The problem is that Israel forgot. They forgot what it was like to be free. They knew what it was like to be free before. Yes, they did. To be blessed, to be prosperous, to be healthy, to be happy, they forgot all of those things. Oh, I'll just let this government take care of me, and then I'll just do whatever it tells me to do, and I'll be happy. I'm not preaching politics today. I'm not going to do it. The problem was they forgot what it was like to be free. Moses was sent to remind them, but also of something else, freedom comes with a price. You don't just, people, listen, the adversary doesn't just let you be free. He doesn't just, well, well, you know, you prayed hard enough and, you know, you clapped your hands Sunday and you said amen twice. I guess I'm going to have to give up. I'm going to have to surrender. Looks like you're, you're doing pretty good. That's not the way a slaver works. Even after you walk away from that and become free, the slaver will try to run you down, will try to chase you down, try to bring you back, do whatever it is that he has to do. He'll unleash his dogs on you. He'll tell you, I can find you wherever you go and whatever you do. But as I told my kids earlier this week, they're not supposed to be, when I get ready to say this, you're not supposed to change, uh, but I told them this week that the most commonly used uh, sentence and scripture for preachers is, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. World, but I'm going to use it right now anyway, so you're just going to have to take it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's an equation that works for everything. The bottom line is, no matter what the devil tries to do, if you'll just keep going towards God, he's not going to get you, and he's not going to win. He's going to lose. I mean, it is an absolute. If you keep going towards Jesus, he's going to lose. He will not win, no matter what it looks like. He came and told them that it, freedom came with a price. Ronald Reagan said this, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for, it must be protected and handed down. It's not delivered in the bloodstream. Listen, Israel forgot yet again, even after Moses gets them out of there, they forget again. Because that's who we are, we forget. If I ask you, Make a list, and you only got uh, 30 seconds to do it. I put a nice little time pressure on there. And I want you to make a list real quick and write it out. And on one side, I want you to write all the bad things that's ever happened to you. And on the right, I want you to write all the good things that's ever happened to you. I guarantee you, no matter how optimistic a person you are, you're going to fill that bad side out quicker. Why? Because we remember that. But we have a difficult time remembering the good stuff. People are sorry, that's not me. I, I'm an optimist too. You understand? If you know me, you know what is true. There's always something getting ready to happen. That's the way it is with an optimist. Right? The glass is half full. I don't even say that. I just drink the water. It's fantastic. Where's the next, where's the next glass? I'm that kind of an optimist. Listen to me. Even I, though, will forget. 
I'll be in a situation and I'll be pleading with heaven. I need you to answer. I need you to deal with this. And God has to come to me. He has to find somebody else to speak to me because I'm not listening to him. And he'll come and he'll speak to me and he'll remind me. And sometimes they don't even know they're Moses. They don't even know that's what they're doing. And they'll come to me and they'll remind me, you've been here before and I delivered you then. How in the world did I forget that? How in the world did I forget that? How did I forget? Listen, I'm born and raised in church, so there can be this little argument that people try to make sometimes where they say, well, you don't really know what it's like to be in the world. Yes, okay, fine. But let me tell you this right now. Sin is sin, and when you know better than to do it, it's even worse. It's not better. And I've had those moments, and I come dragging my carcass to the altar, and I'm, a, I'm just an absolute disheveled mess, and, and I'm a Lord, I need you to move, and I need you to take this. And, I, and then I get up, he heals, he delivers, he forgives, and I go on in that power for a couple of months. Something else comes up, and I forget what he did. I forget that I've already been here before. I'm preaching to somebody if it ain't everybody. I'm telling you right now that God has already done stuff for you that you can now draw from for where you are. But it's not his will for you to stay here. It's not his will for you to cool it. It's not his will for you to sit back and relax right now. Oh, it may seem the safer thing to do, but it isn't what he wants. This morning, please let me take you back. God has done for you before and remind you that what he did before again children of Israel came out with Moses then they get in situations next thing you know they're questioning God again it's almost as if they didn't learn anything kind of like you and me if we'll just be honest why am I going around this I've seen this rock before as if God's will was for me to go around that mountain He's doing it because I'm not allowing him to take me on a two-week trip through some adversaries I could beat to the promised land. I got to spend 40 years on a two-week trip. Brother and sister, listen to me. It is not the will of God for you to do that. And when you get there after 40 years and you pat yourself on the back, I don't think God's happy with that either. When you go, oh, well, I finally, I finally arrived. Yep, you were supposed to be here two weeks after I gave it to you, not 40 years. There is a time frame <laughs> that God has for things. He sees all things we don't, but there's a time frame. There is a, a perfect time for every season. And we can overshoot it. We can miss it. We can miss it because we were too busy going around the mountain one more time. Just one more time, God, and I'll get it together. One more time, and I'll have it together. And it was never supposed to be about you and I having it together. Let me take you back. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. Why? This is a colon. There is an explanation to the first part coming. Understand? What's the reason? There's no fear in love. Love doesn't have fear in it. Okay? Perfect. So it's been separated. But perfect love, love that doesn't have fear in it, love that's just love, okay, perfect love, casts out fear. That's why. You can't be in there. You can't be in there because love automatically casts it out. Whenever fear shows up, love casts it out. Let me ask you, you happily married people, who's the number one person in your life that can speak this kind of thing to you when you're afraid? It is your husband or your wife. They will come to you and they will say love to you, and if they do that, it will cast the fear out of you quicker than anything else. Oh, well, if she thinks that it's going to be okay, well, if he thinks it's going to be all right, that's a lot better. That's a lot off of my shoulders. But do you see the colon after it, what it says? Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You can't be made perfect in love when you're fear because fear is torturous. And love doesn't allow that. Love doesn't allow torment. 
punishment that continues on and on and on. Brother Star, Brother Star, Brother Star, whoa, well, just slow down a minute. Slow down a minute. I've been in that kind of a sin cycle where things, I keep doing the same wrong thing over and over and over and over again, and it's torment. It is. I come to the altar, I repent, he forgives me, I get up, I go back, I do it again, I got to come back, I got to repent again, and it's torturous. Yes, you're absolutely right, and the reason why is because you are not grabbing the perfect love. If you would grab a hold of the fact that no matter how many times you come back, no matter how dirty you get, no matter how many mistakes you make, that God has a plan for you, and God loves you, and God wants to use you, and God has the power to restore you 70 times 7, then you're going to break the cycle. It's not until then, but once it gets up here, you'll realize greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater. I said he's greater. Doesn't matter what's on the other end of the equation. He's greater. Fear, pain, hate, addiction. I've heard people who have been bound in, all, in these things. All of them say this. I've gotten used to it. I live this way. Scar, I know it's not right. But I've gotten used to it. That's supposed to put me off of it. <laughs> it's supposed to explain it. I'm strong enough. I'm tough enough. I've done it long enough. I'm just used to it now. Let's get off my nerves. I'm that. Nowhere in this book, and that's a big book, nowhere does it say I'm supposed to live like this. Nowhere in that book does it say I'm just supposed to feel this. That I'm just supposed to say, well, it's just the way it is. I've gotten used to it. Why? Is it brother star look now? Everybody's not so and so, you know, pick your favorite Christian. Everybody's not this person or that person. Everybody's not capable of doing right. How will you ever know that? The devil has you convinced you're not one of them, and you have no idea that he's done so. And the fact of the matter is that the Lord says he is no respecter of persons. And that means everybody gets the opportunity to be used by God the way he built and designed you to be used. You don't compete. Somebody writes a better book, somebody sings a better song with a better voice or plays better, who cares? Somebody teaches better than I do, who cares? Am I doing all that I've been called anointed purposed by God to do? I can tell you this, the answer is no, if you're still going in circles. Let me take you back. Okay then, you say, I've gotten used to it, this is who I am, this is where I am, okay, that's fine, I can't do anything about it, but don't be surprised when the trials come. Don't be surprised when the impossible starts mounting on you and you have no outlet and no direction and don't know what to do with it. Why? Because God will orchestrate things to get you out of your comfort zone. He will do stuff to nudge you out, Israel. It's not his desire for his people to be enslaved, and he'll make sure you know about it. He will push you. He will prod you. Your comfort zone will become the most uncomfortable place you've ever been in your entire life. That is, if you're still giving your life over to him. There is a choice. You can make a choice and say, I don't want to serve God anymore. And at that point, you've got a whole bunch of mess that you got to deal with and, and hopefully you get restored and all of that. But if you're still saying, I want God to use me, if you're still calling yourself a believer, if you're still saying, I'm following the book, then the Lord is going to send trials to set you on fire to get you out of that place you're stuck in. I'm not sure everybody here agrees with that. I'm not sure everybody's on board with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. 
Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Next verse. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Yay, I got that. I'm none of those things. I just read over that, Brother Star, and whew, that's not my sin listed there, so I'm good. Next verse. And such were some of you. You, what does that mean? You used to be there. It used to be your story. It used to be who you were. It used to be what you used to be stuck before Jesus found you the first time. Can I take you back to that moment again this morning, right now? Back to that moment. Do you remember this being some of you? Do you remember being some of you stuck in sin on your way to hell with no answer until he showed up all depressed, suicidal at the end of your rope and then he found you. You didn't find him. He found you. He finally got through to you. He found a way to bring you to him. Such were some of you. But you are now washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's no longer who you are. You've been freed. You've been redeemed. You've been blessed. You're a child of the King. Clap your hands and lift him up again. Lord, great, fantastic, I'm forgiven, I'm restored. I know all this stuff. I've been serving God long enough. I knew it. Good. Knowledge is good. But until you put it into action, it doesn't mean anything. What are those giants you're facing right now that you can't overcome? The devil's told you. Devil told you can't win. Can't beat this one. Yet in your past, you have examples of when God did exactly that with you. Let me take you back. And you say, oh, that wall, I can't, I can't go over that wall. That wall is insurmountable. I just want you to turn around. I just want you to look back. And all the insurmountable walls you've already come over. You didn't do that. God did it. You say, I can't do it. Good. That's fine. It wasn't you that did those, and it's not you that's going to do these. This wall, this giant, it's not going to come down because you're a cool person. It's going to come down because he wins. He does not lose. I'm reminded of, and I will not try to do, I will not try to do it, but I am reminded of uh, earlier this week, uh, someone, one of the pastors on the worship just put up, he says, uh, says, what is your favorite, what is your favorite message you've ever heard? I don't like that because I can't remember all of them. I know there were messages that I don't even remember who preached them. There's messages that I don't, I'm certainly not going to remember the title of that changed my life. It's all God. He's the one speaking it, you know, and that's what's important. But I, I answered best I could because I like to do that best I can. You know. I said, I don't know. I said, but I'll tell you one that definitely is up there if it's not the number one, and it probably is. I said, and it's not somebody you know, out here. I said, it's my father preached a message, strength for tomorrow. And I'm telling you that you, if you haven't ever heard the message, you really need to hear it. I'm telling you, and I'm not going to do all the stuff, but he talks about Samson killing the lion. Then he comes back later, and he draws honey from the lion's carcass, and it gives him strength to do what God's told him to do. It Included in this is a bee dance and everything. I just don't have time for all of that, but I'm telling you, spectacular. And listen, the point of it fits this today. It fits it so well today, and that's this. The Lord has given you victory after victory after victory. Don't forget about those victories because you can go back to them and draw honey out of that carcass of that enemy you've already defeated to give you strength to defeat the one that's in front of you. It's And the reason the devil wants you to forget about those victories is because he doesn't want you to do that. 
He doesn't want to face a strengthened you. He wants to face a weakened you. But sometimes the devil doesn't even know what that is. The Bible says he came to Jesus after he'd been fasting for 40 days. Can I tell you, that's not when Jesus was the weakest. His flesh was the weakest, but he was the strongest. You don't come after me when I'm fasting and praying and seeking. You don't do it. Lifted by the Spirit into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted. The devil was set up. Do you understand? He was put in a position to lose. Why? Because God knows what he's doing and the devil doesn't. I said God knows what he's doing with you just to save and the devil does not. He's playing by ear. He's doing whatever he can do, but he won't win if you keep going forward with Jesus. Oh, I like the musicians to come. Without my struggle, there'd be no victory. Without my victory, there would be no story. I struggle then so that the victory will give me a story that I can tell others. Who in the Bible, when we read the woman with the issue of blood, she interrupted somebody else's story to have hers done. He was on his way to heal and raise somebody. And she stopped the whole thing in his tracks with her faith. Crawling between people's dirty feet so she could just touch the back end of his garment. If I just, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be, that kind of faith will stop God in his tracks every single time. You don't have to have all your ducks lined up. If you have faith like that, he's going to stop. And he turns around and says, who touched me? Got a crowd pressing in on them everywhere. The disciples are like, oh, no. what do you mean who touched you? There's people everywhere. But they weren't social distancing. They, they were, they were. He, says, he says, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me and virtue, power went out from me. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a whole lot of people going around that are patting me on the back. There's a whole lot of people going around going, oh, this place is closed. There's a whole lot of people going around going, yay, Hosanna. Who aren't going to say Hosanna once I'm up there being crucified. But, oh, we're part of the mob right now. Oh, we're part of the crowd, right? But somebody didn't do that. Somebody got through all what everybody else was doing that didn't mean anything and touched me with a purpose. She needed something, and she actually believed, as crazy as this is, that she doesn't even have to touch me. All she had to do was touch my garment and she would have been made whole. Do you understand? And then she's got to come and sit before him. It was me. And he goes, look at this faith. Look at this faith. Brother and sister, you don't got to be perfect. And you can have that issue of blood for 12 years. But when Jesus walks down your road, that 12 years doesn't mean anything anymore. The opportunity is now. The opportunity is here. What would have happened if that woman with the issue of blood would have said, not today. I just, I'm too weak today. What if she would have said, I'm used to it. She didn't. She never had got used to it. The Bible says she went to doctors all over the place to get healed. She never got used to it. But she saw Jesus. She saw an opportunity. This morning, would you close your eyes? right where you are. What do you see this morning? What did you come in here for this morning? Did you come in here to hear a, a, a good message? Uh, did you come in here to hear a little, little sweet singing? Maybe a little touch here, a little touch there? Or did you come in here with a need and you didn't even know if he was going to meet it or not? I'm telling you, he's walking by your road right now. That's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you need to remember. Let me take you back to what he's already done for you, how he's already moved for you. Remember what he's done miraculously in your life before and draw strength from it right now because he's walking down your road right now. Right now in this house, this morning, he's calling your name. In this house, this morning, he's dealing with your heart and you know it. You can feel it right now. Why don't you surrender to him? Why don't you stop going around the mountain? It's okay. It doesn't matter if it's change. It doesn't matter if that's a, something that can bring fear. Don't let fear into your life. Trust him. Let his perfect love cast the fear out right now. Right where you are right now. Hallelujah. Friends.
Isaiah 40 and 31. But everybody in here probably can quote it. They do. Wait upon the Lord, shall renew your strength. Mount up with wings as eagles. Run. Now, career walking, not fainting. I put it up on Facebook, I think this morning or last night or something. I mean, this, this thought came to me, but it seems to be doing it in reverse. It seems to be in reverse of what you would think. Then you walk, then you run, then you fly. This says you fly, then you run, then you walk. Why? Because we're not running away from something. We're running to something. It is the destination ahead that is important, not what it is we're leaving behind us. We're not fleeing from an adversary. We're headed towards him. David, 1 Samuel 17 and 45, put it up there. Here's David facing Goliath. This is the proper way to handle the situation. He said, David, to the Philistines, I'm coming to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. I'm acknowledging the powerful weapons at your disposal, you big giant you. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. He didn't say he come to me with the stones. He didn't list his own equipment. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is enough to overcome all of your stuff you got. The name, I don't need anything else. He doesn't even need me to do this with. God's going to defeat you. This is the end for you. Regardless, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Next verse. This day, this day, right now. I'm telling you, it's a right now message this morning. This day the Lord will deliver thee into my hand and I will smite thee and take thine head. Here's what I'm going to do to you. And I'm going to take my head from your head from you. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. The purpose is he gets glory and praise. I'm just here for the fun. Next verse. And all this assembly shall know. This is the point. Why do I get victory over my Goliath? So that all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. Next verse. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose. He, he didn't know what dangerous predicament he was in. He had no idea this was his last moments on earth. Do you understand? He thought he was going to win. He'd always won. He was a champion nine and a half feet tall. This was a kid. The Bible says the Philistine arose. He got up to do his job and came and drew nigh to meet David. And David hasted. Does anybody in here? I know that's an old word. Do you know what hasted means? David saw the giant get up and come at him after his wonderful speech. He didn't go hide behind a rock like everybody else. David said, Woo! It's on, buddy. It's the moment. It's happening. He's falling for it. Here he comes. And he ran at the giant. Brother and sister, that's the direction God wants you going in. Not backward. Not standing still. Run toward that giant. I said run toward that giant. Victory is yours. It's yours. I'm telling you, the Lord's telling you this morning. The victory is assured. That giant's head is coming off. Would you stand with me? Take this message to heart this morning. Hear what the Lord is saying. Every single instance of prisons in the Bible, every time they're listed, they are not listed as places to go live. said the prison is never listed as a place to go live in. But Joseph went and he lived in the prison. Peter went and he lived in the prison. No. They were a place to be delivered from. Don't let anything in your life imprison you. That is something you should be delivered from. Something you should be brought out of. And listen to this. Jesus will not just go with you into that jail. He will free you and then demand that you follow him out of it. Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for your people willing to hear. I pray, oh Lord, that they did. I pray that they heard it. I pray, oh Lord Jesus, that they will cause them 
come out of the comfort zone. I pray that it will cause them to put that fear under their feet. I pray that it will cause them to march forward towards you, to march against their adversary, to obtain a victory. You, Lord Jesus, have already given us the ability to have. Even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You neither slumber nor sleep. You've got it all in your hands. Help us, oh Lord. Help Max, the Apostolic Church, to move forward in faith. We love you and praise you. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Why don't you lift him up one more time before we're dismissed.